Andrew, week one of the NFL is coming up. We have a preview on the pod and the latest of what's going on with the media interest of the college football playoff expansion. And the big get, Fox's new number one team who's doing the Super Bowl, Kevin Burkhart and Greg Olson. And they also have the specter of Tom Brady hanging over them. I'm going to take every week I can get. I don't know how many I got, so I'm going to take them all. You know what I mean? So. And we're back. The Morishan and Oran Sports Media Podcast. I'm Andrew Morishan, sports media columnist for the New York Post. He's John Oran. John Arad. The media reporter for the Sports Business Journal. And John, big get this week. Kevin Burkhart and Greg Olson, they are going to call the Super Bowl this year. They're the number one team. Last week, uh, we had the team that they're succeeding are now at ESPN's Monday Night Football, Joe Buck and Troy Aikman. So you can go back and listen to that one. Next week, Amazon begins its Thursday night football exclusive broadcast. We're going to have Al Michaels and Kirk Herbstreet on the podcast. So looking forward to talking to them. Uh, but Burkhart and Olsen, they were tremendous. Looking forward to giving you that in a few minutes. We'll have that up. But as always, we start who's up and who's down. Who's up? Who's down? Andrew, let me lead this one off. My who's up? Jay Marine, Marie Donahue. Maybe we should show, throw Jeff Bezos into it, but uh, everybody at Amazon. Remember when you had Amazon as your who's down a couple of weeks ago? Uh, that was when they were shut out of the Big Ten and UEFA in the same week. There were no big sports media rights coming until the NBA after the 24, 25 season. So it, it was tough for Amazon. Every, if they want to grow in sports, where are they going to grow, grow in sports? Well, guess what? The College Football Playoffs Board of Managers unanimously voted to extend the CFP to 12 teams in 2026. Expansion could come as early as next season. And I expect, based on how aggressive Amazon was with the Big Ten, how aggressive they were with, the, with UEFA, they're going to be even more aggressive with this. And if they want to get into sports, this is the entryway. They know that, and I expect them to be very aggressive. This is great news for Amazon if they really want to get into sports. That's interesting. I thought you're going to go. I thought I swayed you last week when I said the uh, Amazon line about the only package that you know the only bad package for an NFL package is not having one. Uh, I thought that was what that's when I saw that on the rundown. That's what I thought you were going with. I, I don't want to go inside baseball. I know exactly who told you that. <laughs> All right, well, now you can't. It's like uh, the friends. Of I knew this. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I couldn't say anything. All right, my who's up? We're going to stay in college football. Big 12 commissioner, Brett Yarmark. The reason he's opened up negotiations early with ESPN and Fox. So matches what the Pac-12 is doing in terms of talking to those two entities and any, any other entities that are interested uh, in possibly doing deals with them. This is sort of like a half who's up. A half who's up. Yeah, a half who's up. Well, because... Look, for your mark, it's the right move. You need to be on that equal footing with the Pac-12. You can't let them go first and then let them figure out where they're they're getting their money and then you're just left with nothing. You need to make so I'm giving him credit for doing what he needed to do. So it's a it's the right step. Now the question is who's more aggressive? Who brings in maybe a couple other teams uh, from uh, and, and expands? Uh, we know uh, we had Burke Magnus, the number two at ESPN a couple of weeks ago. He, he kind of sounded like he expects uh, these leagues to expand. Uh, and so uh, that's the next move. But your mark, it's a positive move for him because he needed to, to, to make it that they're on equal footing. The Big 12 deal is not up for three years. Pac-12 deal is up in two years. And so now they're both negotiating with ESPN, with Fox, and whoever else uh, could possibly get in there. Uh, I think that was a smart move by your mark. A lot of people still want those college rights. I'm going to go right to who's down, and we're, I'm going to go with Ray Davis, owner of the Texas Rangers. Look, uh, July was a watershed moment in the video business because it was the first time more people watch streaming services like Netflix, YouTube, HBO Max, than cable TV. Quick shout out to the Wall Street Journal's Sarah Kraus, who broke that story. Sarah is an alum of the Washington Business Journal, and she had a cubicle, a couple of uh, cubicles away from me a couple of years ago, back when uh, I went into the, went into work. No, no working from home uh, back then. Are you sort of taking credit for the scoop since like you, you rubbed off on her? 
Yeah, you know what? I I I take uh, ownership over anybody that does well who's in my orbit. Yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. It's kind of like my scoop, generally. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> anyway, look, the main reason that streamers had such a good month is because there were no sports in July. But that's also the problem with cable, cable TV right now. It's becoming what's essentially a sports tier that only caters to sports fans, which is fueling the cord cutting trend, which is why I picked Davis, the, the Rangers owner. I could have really picked any baseball team owner, but I, I, I picked him. Uh, his local rights fees that he gets from RSNs are totally in peril as cord cutting happens, as more of these entertainment viewers are, are seeding the, the uh, cord cutting. Cable was a great business for the sport, regional sports network, a, a great business. Streaming won't be so much, and this is a bad trend for, for baseball team owners. All right, my who's down is Chris Fowler. Now, Fowler, to me, is not a great play-by-player. He's college football uh, with ESPN. He's their number one play-by-player. I think Kirk Herbstreit helps him a lot. He was on Notre Dame versus Ohio State. And let's listen to this clip of this catch by Matt Salerno of Notre Dame. Lined up here. Mayer is in the slot to the left. Ramps him across from him. Butner looking in that direction. Launches downfield. Jump ball. Is it intercepted on the carom or caught Salerno went up? It was juggled. Denzel Burke was there. I don't know what Fowler was looking at there. And look, people make mistakes. This is really hard. And I totally respect play by players. That's something I could do. Um, but you're, this is when you're at the top, you get graded. It's the major leagues. And the thing I, that ESPN, I don't really understand. Like they had Adam Amin. They had Jason Benetti. They have McDonough. Uh, they have some really good play Bob or shoes in. They have some really good play by players. And I, I don't find, I think Fowler just, he just missed either a couple other calls he missed uh, this week. I think Herb Street helps him out a lot. And I think they lucked out. I think at one point the plan was maybe those guys moved to Monday Night Football. I think Fowler might have had the same problems that Joe Tessitore had from moving from college football to Monday Night Football, where it's a bigger stage and just just kind of being slightly off in terms of uh, doing the NFL and Monday Night Football um, probably wouldn't have been the best thing for Fowler and ESPN if that had happened. Andrew, let's move right into the topics. Uh, the NFL season is getting ready to start. We have Kevin Burkhart and Greg Olson as our big get uh, coming up. What are one or two storylines that you're mainly focused on when it comes to the NFL this season? My top two storylines are number one, Amazon Thursday night football. Uh, they will have exclusive coverage. Al Michaels, Kirk Herbstreet will be on the call in the main feed. Uh, that's going to be very interesting to watch. Uh, will people be able to find it? I think the production is going to be excellent. Uh, but and I think they're going to try to Amazon uh, the heck out of the NFL. Uh, which means basically uh, somebody else's product and they try to make it better. Uh, that's what they've done in a number of areas from books to paper towels to anything you can buy at Amazon. There's kind of the Amazon version of things. Uh, and so uh, that's number one. Uh, number two is all the announcer moves. Uh, we have Olsen and Burkhart on later. Uh, we had uh, Joe Buck and Troy Aikman last week. We have uh, Al Michaels, not at NBC. NBC didn't want Al Michaels anymore. And he's with Herb Street on Thursday night. Sunday, all brand new. Yeah, Mike Tirico and Collinsworth, and then your old crew now is Tony Romo and Jim Nance, and so uh, uh, that they'll be interesting as well, even though they're the one that's been around the longest. Uh, so I think the announcers, the amount of money, and the Brady uh, hanging over everything. I think those are my two major storylines. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with you with Amazon. Uh, if anybody that saw my Twitter feed after the uh, their uh, preseason game. We finally got Nielsen rated numbers coming from it, and they did not look great for Amazon. I know it was preseason. I know it wasn't marketed. But if you take a look at about 500,000 viewers were watching it through Amazon. The other half were watching it on over-the-air television or, or via direct TV. The, the, the big numbers are going to come with their first game. In our position, we have never seen an, uh, a Nielsen, a third party come in and give us numbers like this. I mean, Nielsen is, is uh, rating other, uh, other programmers, uh, streamers and other aspects of it, but this is the first time that they've, they've fallen into my lap and it's uh, gonna be incredibly interesting just to see how streaming differs from a uh, regular TV in terms of the audience makeup and everything else. 
All right, we'll do a little over under in a moment, but I first want to make a point. All right, that's my Frances impersonation that you always talk about. Okay, we'll do a little over under. Wanda. <laughs> because, because our we'll have a podcast next week. We'll have Kurt Hershey and Michael's on, but let's get this out of the way. But first, I want to make a point about the preseason. Okay, I don't really think you can count those numbers. I, I get it, like you put them out there, but it's a preseason game. There are about 15 people in the stands and they didn't really market it and you have to find it. Now you could say the, you know, the opposite argument would be, well, Detroit and the Steelers have the best uh, rating in you know a decade for CBS, but you find those games because you're used to that. So I don't think you really can count much into these preseason numbers personally. Uh, I'll disagree with you here, Andrew. You can take a look at the audience makeup and, 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 uh, and view it in that lens. Whether or not, it, like, I think all told it got over a million, who cares? Like, it, 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 that, it's going to be the real first regular season uh, numbers that, that come. It's not week one that you're really, like, I, I think that the one misnomer is you're, like, kind of like, week one, nobody wants to do this, streaming stinks. It's like, it's going to be growth over the years. I, that's not what I, that's not necessarily what I said. I, I, I was fascinated. I'm misquoting you now. You are, I'm being totally misquoted. The, You've made the, it. Half of their audience came from traditional linear television. And so regardless of whether it was 1 million or 20 million, that's, that, that is, that's significant to me. That's the sort of like shows that the, the move to streaming is going to be a little bit slower than, than some people suggest. I mean, it's all one data point. So of course it's all going to change throughout. It's going to change from week six to week, week one as well. Uh, but uh, it's still, it's unique to get these numbers and I'm going to OD on them. Okay. Uh, what ad age reported that uh, 12 and a half million is what, Amazon is promising advertisers. I'm not giving you that number. We both agree. Come on, that. under, <laughs> under. <laughs> Way under. Okay, we're not doing that number. Over, under. I'm going to set the number at 8 million. Are you going to take the over or the under? What are we talking about here? Are week we talk- one, week one, week one. This week is Kansas one. City and, and LA Chargers. Week one, not this Thursday, the following Thursday. Ooh, 8 million. You're good at the over unders. You pick right around where I think it's going to, going to be. Good job you, Mikey. Go. I'm going to, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to give you a slight over. I think that they're going to get over 8 million. I think it's a good matchup. I think it's going to be the first one. They're going to market it heavily. The NFL is going to market it heavily. I, I, if they don't get over 8 million, I would be a little concerned for this season uh, moving forward, but I, I, I would say over. All right, Burkhart and wait, what's your over under? You gave the you gave the number. What you gotta come on. I'm going to eight million exactly. I'm gonna go, <laughs> I'm gonna go slightly under. I'm gonna go 7.7 million. I think I'm right. That's the range, but I think it'll be slightly under eight million on that first week. I think it's you know, over time it'll get higher, but I think slightly under eight million for that first week. All right. Let me go uh, to two more quick things. One is uh last season I was a devoted follower of the Manning cast. It kept me watching longer. Uh, it, it had me watching games I didn't uh, particularly uh, care about. I thought it was an excellent show. I'm dying to see what the numbers this season are going to be like now that ESPN has a, a, a Super Bowl ready booth in Buck and Aikman. Are people going to be looking for that alternative feed as much as they were last season? Or are they going to be uh, going, going for the normal feed with Buck and Aikman? And I think those numbers are really going to tell a story. Well, I think there's two factors. There's, yes, you have a better crew that people like more, I think, in Buck and Aikman. So, yeah, so maybe it'll be on ESPN1. However, Man and Cast might not be as good as in year two, but there will be more people who know about in year two, right? So the first thing, as we've learned in the podcast, is that you have to have people know about that you're on. Then you have to have people actually find you, and then they have to stay with you. So I do think that that will be interesting if the Man and Cast numbers go up, even and main ESPN with Buck and Aikman go down, which I'm not saying is going to happen, but that has, you know, rival TV executives have mentioned that to me that, you know, that is a possibility because of, you know, now more people are familiar that the Manning cast will be on on certain weeks and they enjoy that. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that is something definitely to watch. And numbers yeah, to watch. I think the number that I'm watching is less about the sheer number that the Manning cast brings in, but the percentage of, of the regular telecast that that number takes. How much will that will that change going up and down? And having more games uh, simulcast on ABC will certainly depress that number a little bit. So what, uh, that, that's uh, one area to look at. And I'm going to come with the prediction, uh, easiest prediction that there is. NBC's Sunday Night Football for the 12th season in a row will be the most watched primetime telecast. 
Uh, it sounds like a broken record. It has been more than a decade now, 12 seasons, if, if they do it this season. But it goes to show, like I said, uh, for, for the uh, who's up, who's down, linear television is all sports now. And that shows why sports are so popular. It shows why the Big Ten got as much as it got, why the NFL is now a $110 billion enterprise on, on linear television. Expect that to continue and, and for its lead over the second place to even grow. John, let's move to college football. They're going to expand the playoffs from four teams to 12. This will have TV implications. Right now, ESPN has the four-team playoff. Uh, what do you see happening here? You know, I've been reading so much, Andrew, about a huge windfall coming because of this. Currently, ESPN pays about $470 million a year for three games. They're going to add eight games, so triple that number, right? Uh, I, I don't think... I don't think CFP is going to get anywhere close to that. I think that you know th these are uh, games coming in that are not going to necessarily be TV friendly. I think that you can use as a comp uh, the NFL Wild Card. Uh, NBC and CBS are going to pay about uh, seventy million dollars per year for one Wild Card game. That Wild Card game is going to outrate any of these games that CFP is is adding. So it's going to be well below that. I think they're going to be lucky. To get double, I don't see Fox Sports, NBC, CBS clamoring for a Cincinnati Utah matchup or a Boise State Oregon matchup. I mean, those are the types of games that we're going to be adding in to the first round here. So I, I think it's, it's going to be kind of a tough road to go. Amazon Factor. I mean, I think that's the one. Could this be the one where they kind of say, like they did with the NFL, they get Thursday night uh, to say, like, you know, we're going to pay a lot more than anybody else. This is what we know. We know that Amazon wants to get into college football. They were especially aggressive to try to get the Big Ten rights. This is an entryway for Amazon to get into college football. Uh, will they be able to pay enough? I think one of the lessons that they must have learned, both from UEFA and from, from the Big Ten, is that they really need to overpay in order to get it. It's like Fox and the NFL back in 1994. They're going to have they're going to have to put a really big number on the uh, on the table and I think that there's a good possibility that they might because as as we said before the uh, the there aren't that many rights deals out there for Amazon to get and they do want to grow their sports offerings. Yeah, and they're going to start Thursday night football next week. They got Kirk Herbstreit and Al Michael so they got serious about uh in terms of the production that they'll put behind it. So they could at least come to college football and show, you know, hey, look, we are serious about having uh, the top production that you can have. Also, Fred Gadelli is producing. Uh, and so they're showing kind of they have to display that they can actually put these uh, events on. So I, they are doing that already, I believe, with what, what they've shown in terms of their hires and what we saw in the preseason with the NFL. Yeah, with Amazon bidding it up, there is a potential for it to get about a billion dollars uh, per, per year. Even I, I think that even that number is, is a lot higher than the linear TV networks were, are, are going to go. I mean, what ESPN is paying right now for the top three games, those are three good games uh, and, and, and the semifinals and, and the championship. And even the semifinals that ESPN pays for, how many of those are blowouts? They're not close at halftime. You know, have Alabama rolling over whoever its uh, opponent seems to be, especially in the semifinal. It's, these aren't the most... I think it's good for college football. I love seeing the expansion, but these aren't the most uh, uh, attractive games to TV networks. All right, John, last week we had Troy Aikman and Joe Buck on the pod. And this week it's Kevin Burkhart and Greg Oltz and there are big gets. Uh, they begin this year as Fox's number one team and they'll end the season calling the Super Bowl in Arizona in February Guys, first off, congratulations uh, on the promotions and doing the Super Bowl. Not many guys have done that. Uh, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. And uh, let's get week one. I mean, we we made it, Olson. At least to week one, we made it. It's a good hey, start. I'm going to take every week I can get. I don't know how many I got, so I'm going to take them all. You know what I mean? So <laughs> week we'll one. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. For fired sure. up, KV. It's going to be great, buddy. All right. I don't know if I feel safe on this podcast. We have two Jersey guys uh, on here, like the Springsteen, Bon Jovi. Burkhardt Olson, I like it. The story, uh, Kevin, Colin, um, uh, Greg's high school games. Uh, I have two questions for this. Uh, first, Kevin, did you know, uh, did you suspect that you were calling a future pro? And uh, the, the same question uh, to you, Greg, did you suspect that, hey, this guy really has uh, the voice and some chops? This, he's going to go somewhere. 
I, I mean, you know, so Greg was the Gatorade player of the year uh, and he was great, right? I mean, you know, his, his whole family was great. His brother was quarterback of the team at the time, uh, Christian, and his dad was a coach. So, I, I mean, I knew he was great. I, I wasn't even thinking of like down the road for he or myself. So um, I just, I, they were fun to cover. You know, he was a great kid. It was a, it was a really good family and his father took care of us. His father would, you know, say, come on down to the office on Friday and uh, we'll watch some film. That's a bad impression, but he's got like the gravelly, like big coach voice <laughs> and he, he put on film. And so here I am like me and uh, my, my guys were a bunch of dorks, like hanging out. We're, we don't know anything. And he's like, this is what we're going to do. And it was amazing. It was like a production meeting in high school. So I just know from that standpoint, uh, it was great experience. So I, no, I never was thinking like, oh, I'll see Greg in the NFL. Like, you know, I would. <laughs> I mean, he certainly had a better chance to get there than I did. I'll tell you that. Greg, what was your impression of, of this guy coming and calling the high school games there? You know, you think in high school in those days, right? We're, we're so accustomed to now, you know, you put on, you know, especially this time of year on, you know, Friday nights, you can put on ESPNU and you can put on these channels and there's high school games, right? High school kids now are used to being on TV. They're on, you know, they're online, they're on social media. Back then, for our game to be broadcast on what was just a local AM radio station was a big deal, right? To be covered in the sports section of the local paper the next morning on, you know, on Monday morning, like that was a big deal, right? So to have at the time, you know, to have Kevin and have the beat, you know, have reporters and stuff cover our games as a high school kid, you know, you felt like you know, you're like, damn, this is cool. Like you want to go talk to them and have them interview you. Like I, I, I remember thinking back to those days and how cool it was and you know, to have people be able to listen to our games. And I just remember working with Kevin, right? Of course, everyone always knew him because he had this just unbelievable, like charisma and his voice and his delivery. I mean, he had that when he was 20 years old covering us 100 years ago. So, I mean, did I think Kevin and I would ever work together and that I would ever get into broadcasting? No chance. That was so far off my radar as a 17-year-old kid in high school. I was just thrilled that WGHT thought we were good enough that they would send Burkhart and his guys to not only to some of our practices and meetings, but then on a Friday night or Saturday afternoon, we were the high school game of the week and we were able to be, you know, broadcast on an AM radio station. Like at the time that was, that was really all we had to work with. And uh, I, I just remember thinking back how cool it was. How do you rate his imitation of your dad? One to not 10. My, so the other part, his imitation is spot on in, in concept because what made it such a good production meeting and, you know, it's like, it's like when you follow somebody really good on Twitter and sometimes like you don't love all of it, but it's just so good. You can't get enough being around my dad when he was coaching the team is like that. Like some of it, you'd almost like hold your breath and be like, Ooh, like, was like <laughs> but it was so entertaining and he had so much energy and he had so much enthusiasm and he had that raspy voice. And so it was, I could imagine if I was Kevin and I was a young guy learning this business, like, I know he's my, he's a, my dad would be a great guy to be able to get in his hip pocket and get an inside look, because if you can get through doing with him, you can work with anybody. Oh my gosh. We, we, we'd anybody. be fun on the sidelines too. Like he would, he would be, he would be wild. Like, you know, crushing he, everybody, just crushing everybody. It's funny. We did this show back in the day. If, uh, if I found this picture, you guys would have loved it. You, you would have loved it. And trust me, when we got paired together last year, Rachel, my wife, was looking through every photo we had. We did this show when I was at GHT. It was Wayne Hills against Wayne Valley. It was like a big rivalry game. So we did a show at this local restaurant uh, in Wayne. And we packed it with both teams, cheerleaders, parents, fans. It was awesome. And, and I had literally everybody in pictures except for Greg, his father, his brother, who, who now works with us as, as a spotter, like all these people and not one together with Greg. Oh, there it is. There That's it is. That's For those great. watching on YouTube, they can see, and we can, we'll post that on social. Uh, you can see the whole picture here. Greg has it posted up here. Yep. Sitting next to Burkhart's Art Stapleton. You guys know Art? Oh, yep. Yeah, Art Stapleton, long time, yeah. now giant beat writer. Yeah. yeah. He covered us in high school. Him and Kevin hosted the show. The fact that I'm not in that picture is a shame. Sad. You were too that big is, time. That is a shame. All right. Kevin, before we move to present day, I want to go back to, I don't know if you've ever told this story before, uh, but you spent eight years at WGHT. And then at one point, did you, you went and 
uh, you almost left the business a little bit and, and sold cars. Can you give us that story? Um, you know, I, have, I know it hasn't been, I'm just kidding about that. For people who read me, uh, I, I wrote the story originally about 15 you years did. ago, and now I've mentioned it like 50 times ever. But new audience, Kev, uh, let, let's hear that story because it is a great one. And it is, it's an important one because I, I don't think you're close to quitting, but you definitely were at a crossroads and now you're going to be calling the Super Bowl. So just give us a little bit of a taste of what happened there. Yeah, no, I mean, look, it, it's, I, I actually like talking about it. Like, you know, people bring it up all the time, but I like that they bring it up. It's, it's good for two reasons. For me, it was a turning point in my life, let alone my career, because I just was, I was just sick of not getting anybody to return my phone calls or, you know, even tell me that I sucked. Just give me some correspondence, anything that you received what I sent you or received my email. Right. Um, and I, you know, it's just making horrendous money and not going forward. And I was just frustrated and annoyed. So I just decided to pick up the Sunday classifieds. And I, I did one of these, like look straight ahead, put my finger down and it was on pine belt Chevy in Eatontown, New Jersey. And they were hiring and I went in and said, I've never sold cars before. Like, okay, you're hired, go out on the floor. Um, had literally no clue what I was doing. I just knew I needed something different. And, um, so it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It motivated me. I learned a lot of life lessons. I learned how to ask for things and, and to, that I wanted, which I was always so passive on doing. Um, because if you don't ask the customer for the payment or for certain things you have to get, you're not going to get it. It was pretty simple. And the reason why I like telling is because for me, I wouldn't be here without that, without that moment, without that year of my life. And it's also like, I just hope it's inspiring for others, like whether it's this industry or other it's not always like A to B, right? Like, it's not always like, okay, I'm good at college, going to get this major, going to just rifle on and be a complete success. It's not. So I, I cherish that. And I hope that other people take motivation in that. But, you know, I worked there, finish the story and not go too long. I worked there for about a year. And Mike Trebino is now a good friend who owned the dealership. He heard me one night on WCBS radio. They had a couple people sick and they called me. I got a shift at night, like doing updates in New York. And he heard me driving home and he's like, holy cow. He's like, I heard you. You sound good. He's like, I, this is like a real thing. I kind of thought you were kidding that you, you want to do, you know, radio and TV. So after that, he made a pact. He's like, anytime something comes up between you and me, you tell me and you can leave. He's like, just work hard while you're here. And he was one of my best allies. And that's what happened. I started getting more shifts. I started getting shifts at the fan. Um, and it was because of that. What year was that again? Oh gosh, I'm so bad with years. I'd have to really think about that. Um, what was it? I want to say, let's see. I started at SNY in 07, 03 ish, maybe. Yeah. So, oh, on, were you good at selling cars? Wait a minute, John, John, just before you ask him that, two decades later, think about that. Selling cards two decades later, exactly. We're going to go 03 because that works with the numbers. Totally yeah. normal. 03, totally. 20 years later, you're doing the Super Bowl. That's pretty incredible. Was I good at it, John? I, so I, I was okay. I was okay, but this was fun. I didn't know this when I was leaving, when I, when I, when I got like full time at CBS and then had a bunch of stuff at the fan, uh, Mike goes, Hey, he's like, you know, we did these things. We do these things, these customer service, uh, uh, surveys. He's like, you want to know where you finished? I was like, yeah. He's like, you were number one in the store. So I, I didn't sell the most cars, but I was the number one customer service in the store. So there you go. There you go. Now let's turn to this off season. Uh, Troy leaves, Joe leaves. First off, Greg, your reaction when this happens? What, what's going on in Greg Olson's head? Oof. I don't think we can cover what's going on in my head in the course of this conversation because there was a lot of conversations. Me and Burkhart would be on a lot of late night phone calls reacting to a lot of your stories, actually. Um, and, you know, just like everybody else, not really having a good understanding of how things were going to play out, right? There was a lot of speculation. There was a lot of rumor all through last year. And then when the news came that Troy was going to leave, you know, obviously my phone blows up and I reach out to Kevin to see what he had heard. And then, you know, I don't think anyone could have imagined the next sequence of events that played out up until, you know, this moment today, but, um, you know, but I'm grateful for it. It was, it was a, it was a crazy situation. It's all worked out at least in the time being um, the way we would have, you know, preferred it to obviously selfishly. We were hoping all along that Kevin and I would get a crack at it, especially with this year, you know, being the Super Bowl year. But, um, you know, at times I thought I had, I thought I was definitely going to get it. At times I thought I had no chance. At times I thought a lot of different people were going to get it. I never thought Brady was going to get it. Um, so I think like everybody else, I was wrong. But I, I'll tell you, the best call I got was, when Kevin called me after he met with, with the Fox folks and they came out and, and met with him and, and whatnot shortly after it was announced that, that Joe was going to go with Troy. 
and that they told him that he was going to be the guy. And, you know, the reason I share that is, yes, selfishly, I wanted, don't get me, who doesn't want to call the Super Bowl? But just knowing Kevin for as long as I have and knowing how long Kevin's been in this industry and grinded in this industry and just made his made his career based off just how good he was and how good he treats people and just his approach. Like if one of us was going to get it without the other, I was like, just please let it be him. Right. Like I've been doing this for one year. Do I want to do it? Hell yeah. I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying I want to be like a pity party, but I was like, once Kevin told me he had it, I was like, if I get it, that's just now we're playing with the house's money. So like, that was the best step along the entire way. When the, when Fox said, all right, Kevin, you're going to replace Joe. You're the voice of the network. We're going to have you call Super Bowls, whatever. We don't know who your partner is. Um, like that, that was probably the best step along the way up until, you know, at the end when we realized at least for one year, Kevin and I could stay working together. So you, you brought up uh, uh, Tom Brady. Are, are you going to try to convince him to play into his 50s? I'm assuming. Right, Greg? Uh, listen, I'm not telling. I don't think anybody's telling Tom Brady what to do, <laughs> um, it seems. But, you know, I, my approach and, and I've said this to Kevin and, 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 you know, our team at Fox, you know, my approach this year is everyone wants to talk about Brady and, and I get it right. Like I, I, I've lived in this world a long time. I understand the reality of situations and the reality of sometimes Things don't have to necessarily be fair. They just, they are what they are. And I'm good with that. You know, my goal this year is Kevin and I had a blast doing it last year. We've had a blast, you know, off, you know, off the screen on, on, on the broadcast. If we get one year at it, I mean, what a great year, right? And we're going to call Super Bowls. We're going to call the best games of the year. We're going to call an entire, I've never called a playoff game. Like I'm sitting home last year, texting Kevin being like, this is bullshit. Like, why are we not calling a game? Like all these other crews are calling all these games and we're sitting on the couch, right? Like, I want to go call those games. Like that's the comp, you know, that's the competition of the whole thing. And um, so if this is the one year I'm going to make the absolute most of it, we're going to enjoy our time together. Our crew has been awesome. We're going to try to give people a great listen, maybe a little different, maybe who knows? I don't know. People make up their own minds, but um, that's my goal. And at the end of the year, what happens happens. But uh, along the way, I'm going to just try to maximize the most of this season and the opportunity that I've been given to work with Kevin and, and Aaron and Tom and this whole group and uh, where it goes, I don't know, but I don't think any of us can predict the future. So we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Greg, I, I will get off uh, Brady, but you, you were describing sort of the roller coaster of emotions that, that you were dealing with. Where were you at the point that they, they announced the, the Brady hiring? Was that, was that a nader? Was that just sort of like you knew you were going to get at least a year? So, so you felt okay. So it's actually pretty funny. So I was home all off season, right? Living and dying with every report, speculation, everyone's reporting a million different names. And I actually had a trip planned up to go see Buffalo up to the bills. Um, a bunch of my old coaches are there and I just know a lot of people in that organization. So I went and spent uh, two days at their OTA practice. Um, so I'm there and I'm actually in the tight ends room. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I'm in the tight ends room and we're going over film and we're talking about, you know, route the tight end coach in Buffalo was my tight end coach in Chicago. We're very good friends. And all of a sudden my phone's sitting off to the side and it's just going crazy. I can hear it vibrating. So I'm like, hold on guys, sorry. And I, I pick it up to turn it off and I have a hundred messages and it's every alert from every, you know, app is, you know, Tom Brady announces the voice, you know, the face of Fox sports. And I'm like, Holy shit. They like, I came out of nowhere. So now I got to put my phone down and like, finish the rest of my presentation in the meeting. So I was out of town and traveling. So it wasn't a great time to get the news, but yeah, when it settled in, I knew he wasn't going to do it this year. I didn't know if I would do it, but um, here we are. And then when you look at it, right, I've written this, Greg, like I feel like it's kind of, you're in a good position, right? Because if they don't hire Tom Brady right now and you get it, the, the specter of like a star quarterback retiring would still be over your shoulder if you don't do a good job. Right. Like that's what that would be. Whoever's next. If it was Brady retired, uh, Breeze, you know, could come back into the picture, uh, Aaron Rodgers, whoever. So to me, you get the opportunity kind of to, to do the job. Uh, the pay scale now has kind of gone up in terms of what uh, Brady's making. So that makes the whole like uh, circumstance a little bit better. And if just you to be clear, it's gone up, but let's just be clear that it hasn't gone all the way up, but continue. Go ahead. Well, for you, it's gone up. I know. I think you're doing pretty well, uh, but yes. But in terms of where the, where everything, what guys are getting paid now to do the job. And if you look at this small group that are in it, right, there's Romo, Aikman, um, Collinsworth, 
Brady, you. Uh, and those are the people that are kind of, you know, other people could be involved in the future, but if you do a good job, you're going to be in that picture. What are you, 36, 37 years old? Uh, I think you're pretty well positioned. Now that, again, frustration throughout the process, it's very quiet, the whole thing, I understand that. But now that you look at it, um, how do you like where you're positioned in terms of right now and for the future? At the end of the day, I'm, I'm very grateful to be in this position, right? I mean, I've been doing this for a very short period of time. Um, and for Fox from the very beginning has always believed in me and given me opportunities that frankly, not a lot of other guys were given, you know, back in 17, me and Kevin and Charles Davis call a call a three man booth. We call a game, um, you know, as I'm still playing, you know, I, I wasn't even close to, you know, I went on to play three more seasons, you know, called another game with Kenny Albert in 2019. I mean, they were giving me opportunities to do things with the network. You know, I've sat on the studio show, like they always gave me opportunities that I never took for granted and that I, that I didn't view lightly. And I'm, I'll always be grateful for that. So uh, right now I'm thankful. I'm grateful for this opportunity. I'm going to try to make the most of it, but I think to your earlier point and where I think Kevin and I granted, he's been at this a lot longer than I have, but we share a lot of similarities in the sense of Kevin's only calling the super bowl because he's unbelievable at his job. That was the box he checked. He was just good. Relative to the other guys you just mentioned, the reality for me, and I've known this since the day I've decided to pursue it, I was going to only check the box of being good. I'm not a Hall of Fame quarterback. I didn't play for the Cowboys. I didn't play. And that's that's not a knock on anyone. That's just the reality that I understood that I was entering into. There's not a lot of former tight ends on prime premier TV jobs. You know, there's just not a lot of them. So I always knew, like at the end of the day, when I got opportunities to do stuff, I needed to be good. I needed people needed to enjoy listening to what I had to say. They need that was the only way I was ever going to be able to get opportunities was to just be good at it. Kevin's the the epitome of that. So I think to a degree that's why we've always enjoyed working together. I think that's why we work well together and appreciate one another because in that sense we're only going to go as high as our abilities take us and I think there's something to be said for that and I've enjoyed that grind, right? I've enjoyed trying to beat out maybe more prominent guys for high positions who maybe have a better resume than I do, but I don't know. I I'll go head to head with anybody and let people decide for themselves. Greg, I got one more on Brady. What's your relationship with Brady? Do you know him well? Like what's that, what's that like? I, I don't have a, a strong relationship with Tom. Um, we've only connected one time um, back in 2020 when the Panthers let me go. Um, we were connected through some mutual friends. He was going to be a free agent. I was a free agent and we had a couple conversations, you know, obviously the allure of going to play with Tom at that stage of my career was, was awesome. And, and he was, he was so great and, and receptive and, and we went back and forth a few times. The timing didn't work out. I was a free agent back during the, I got cut during the Super Bowl. He had to wait till free agency started in March. I couldn't wait that long. So obviously I ended up going in, into um, <clears throat> up to Seattle and, and before he went to Tampa, it didn't work out, but that was really our, our, our one, kind of correspondence and you know i've seen him at a million games over the years and have always you know you know said hello and goodbye and you know obviously he's a guy from afar you just it'd be an understatement to say you respect him and you know all those things that everyone else feels i mean he's the greatest football player of all time and he's always been incredibly kind and generous to me and my family and whatnot so i have nothing but rate you know positive and rave reviews as far as my interactions with tom i don't know him personally that well but every time i have been around him he's been nothing but kind It'll be interesting. Week two, we have uh, the we have the Bucks uh, and Saints. Uh, Greg is going to lead off the production meeting. Tom, I, I just saw a report that you're playing for another eight years. Is there any truth to that? Rumor or... <laughs> Congratulations on your latest extension. <laughs> I paid it. <laughs> yeah. You might want to take out a loan, though. Unfortunately, yeah, uh, yeah I, I can't pay his. I, Burkhart, I can't cover that. No, I cannot. Can you stand one more Brady question? Uh, I might Kevin, have one more. What, too. I can. Listen, then we're you done, can't, but, you but, can't uh, offend me with questions. I can answer. I, I, I'll answer anything. Well, this one's for if, Kevin. If you know anything actually, about but, Greg, there is, there is nothing that affects him, man. That's the beauty of it. Right, right? I mean, we... <laughs> it is we what it is. for a fact. Kevin, what's hey. your, your relationship like with, with uh, Brady? Yeah, I mean, Sam, I don't know him that well because I, you know, I didn't do Patriots games, right? I mean, we do the NFC. I think I had, I think I had two Patriots games um uh previous to him coming to tampa bay so i just i just have our interaction from um the couple of production meetings that we had uh since he's been at tampa and he's always been great 
um, you know, with us, but I don't know him intimately. Um, you know, we did text, uh, I'd say a couple weeks after the news, after it died down a little bit. And, and then that was it. Then it's like, Hey, you have a great year and, you know, I'll see you down the road type of thing, because it's, you know, right now we got, uh, this in front of us. So I, I just feel like it's one of those things. Great. Congrats and have a good year and, and move on. So we've always said, I, I've always enjoyed it. Uh, but I don't know Tom well, well. All right, last Brady one for me. Come Jan- come January, Bucks are out of the playoffs, right? If Brady were added to a booth with you two guys, can you make that work, or do you think that's too difficult? Um, you know, I know what I think Fox might be thinking in terms of that, but I just want to see what you guys think in terms of that scenario, uh, in terms of him being added and trying a three man booth that late in the year. I, I think I think Greg and I can make anything work. I I think, first of all, like we have this amazing crew that's done a gazillion big games. So already we've done one preseason game. We feel comfortable, but I feel like, look, I know we've done one year. I'm not saying we're reinventing broadcasting. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that he and I are close. Like, like we get along, right? Like we look forward to the doing the games as much as we do is having an old fashioned on Saturday night and, and having laughs. Like, it's like, so I just feel like whatever, whatever happens, we'll, we'll roll with whatever. You know, I, I have no idea uh, if, if what Fox is thinking in terms of that, and I can't handle that. So, but I, w- what I do know is whatever happens, I feel like we can handle anything, you know, in terms of that. So. Yeah. I, I don't think that'd be a good idea personally. I think that'd be a tough spot for everybody. I mean, I even, especially Tom, I mean, throwing him in there on that big stage, but, um, there's a hard, listen, I don't, I don't, I have no, right. No clue. No. So this is not like conjecture or, or like, but I don't know if you're anyone, Tom or anyone like first broadcast ever, you want to jump in a booth having never done it in a playoff game. Like I sound, that sounds like it's a pretty hard thing to do. Right. So who knows? I mean, I let's go, let's do week one first and then, <laughs> and then we'll figure it out. Let me get to that. And Greg, what's a successful season for you guys for Kevin and I, yeah. I don't know. I guess that you write us good articles, so you better write us good articles. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's going to be it's tough. tough. Marshan, right? Wow. Straight forward. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. No I mean, you write no promises. I mean, I mean, give me a. I don't know what do you do, like clickers or something. Is yes. that your thing or whatever? Yeah. Just yeah. give us the best you've ever given, and that's fine. No, I listen. I I don't know. I I don't I don't listen. I don't know. I'm very new to this industry. I I know football, right? I know hanging out with Burkhart in the booth and talking football the way we see it and the way we find it to be interesting. It might not be for everybody. It might not be everybody's style. Uh, I'm sure it's not. At the end of the day, Kevin and I are going to talk the game, talk the storylines as we see it, as we find it interesting. It might be similar to what people have had in the past. It might be different. I don't know. I guess that's all in the eye of the beholder. But I think success for Kevin and I is that we go out there and each week, just have a great time and call a football game, right? We're not, we're not building rocket ships. We're not reinventing the wheel here. We're talking about a football game. We're very fortunate. We're going to get to call arguably one of the best games of every week, which is going to then culminate into, you know, playoff games all the way through to, of course, the biggest sporting event of the year in the Super Bowl. So I think just enjoy each one of those opportunities. Who knows how many of those you, you get. And as far as, reviews and what people think i don't know i don't know i don't really know what that entails right i I think if you asked a million people i think everyone thinks some people think everyone's great and some people think everyone sucks and then the real the normal people are somewhere in the middle kevin how do you view success like like what are your sort of metrics with that i've never really thought of that until you just asked me right now um you know i i think um Every, look, I think in, in your mind, everyone has their own goals, right? And um, I think you can only control what you can control. So um, look, as a kid, did I dream about like doing a Super Bowl one day when I was seven, eight, you know, 10, 15 years old, all that time? Yeah. But was it ever realistically like in my head the last, you know, I don't know, 15 years? I don't know. Like I, I, what, I was never, everyone has their goals. I was never a person that's like, oh man, if I don't, you know, call a Super Bowl, then I'm, my career's a failure. I, I, I don't know. It just was never me. Like I wanted to do the best that I could out of anything that I was doing. And because we live in a subjective world, it's not going to make everybody happy. So my two things are do the best I can. I'm going to do it my way. This is more than two things, by the way, I can't add. I'm going to do it, do the best I can. I'm going to do it my way and have fun with it. And, and just work hard and grind at it to the best of your ability. Like there's going to be people that love you, people that don't, 
but I think if you if you do that and you treat people kindly along the way, then hopefully that's a success, right? So for us, do our games feel big? Do we capture the moment? Um, those are the questions I think that you that, that you want us to do, and I think we will. Yeah, uh, Joe Buck, you know, he's he's talked a lot about Twitter, and you know, uh, I think John, I don't want to speak for John, but you know, Joe Buck's one of the best ever, in my opinion, right? Uh, the, the question on Twitter is kind of. Yeah, I don't really get it. You know, like you said, it's subjective. Some people are going to like it. You did an interview the other day with Deadspin where you said, if they don't like me, I don't give an F. I can't let it affect how I do my job. Just what did you mean by that? And can you expand on what you're talking about with that, Kev? Yeah, well, like I wasn't doing it for a headline, um, but, you know, Deadspin, that's fine. I, I don't care. But it was just in the conversation asking about criticism um, and yeah, I'll keep it PG, but, you know, it just kept harping on the criticism thing. And I said, I don't give a I, I just don't, I just don't, right? Like there are people that, there are people that matter. They're, like, you know, my bosses at Fox, my coworkers, um, you know, my family, people in the industry, um, you know, people that have critiques or things to say that matter that you have to take into, you know, your form and, and maybe decide if you're doing something differently or whatever. And then there are people that are entitled to their opinion. Like, so that's fine. If there are going to be people on Twitter that, uh, you know, I'm sure there's going to be people that I've had, I've had really good, you know, interactions on Twitter and mostly to be completely honest, I would say 85, 90% positive in my, in my life. So I wasn't like trying to say, oh my gosh, I've been, I haven't. So there's been people, they're always going to say after every NFL game, some will be like, oh, I can't believe you're rooting for the Cardinals or you suck. You're rooting for the Ravens. I'm like, I got news for you. I was just rooting for a close game. So that's going to be what it is, but there's always going to be people that don't like your style. You and Greg do this fine. I, I get it. Right. I had my favorites growing up too. So what I'm saying is I don't give a fly in, you know, what, if you think that, because I'm going to do it the same way I've done it. So that's what I meant. Greg, your same attitude. Yeah. I mean, I I've operated in an environment where, where response and feedback and criticism was kind of name the name of the game. So, I mean, listen, does nobody, it's human nature that nobody wants to be disliked, right? Nobody wants to be viewed as being bad. That that's human nature across the board. I've been fortunate. I've operated in an environment where the outside perspective of my career and the people who've evaluated my games, my career, my seasons have had very little impact on my success or lack thereof. And so I've operated in that environment for a very long time. And to Kevin's point, yeah, would it be nice if every article written about you was that you're the best thing that's ever happened and every tweet on you know, every tweet and post and whatever is about how amazing you and Burkhardt are. Obviously everyone would choose that, but that's never going to be the reality of our world. That's never going to be the reality of social media specifically. And I'm used to that, right? I would have games where I had 120 yards and then I'd meet some lady the next week in the grocery store. And she told me I lost her fantasy team and she hated me, right? Like I get it. Like criticism is nothing new to me. I've lived it my entire life. And, uh, this is just a different arena, a little more of a open, you know, open season on, it seems like it's like a hobby on games to just take us assault a commentating crew. But uh, yeah, I'm with Kevin. I, I would prefer if people thought I was good, but I, it doesn't really affect what I'm going to do. I have one last one. Kev, you got to uh, throw out the first pitch. Uh, at the uh, at City Field last week, I have two questions actually. First off, Greg, what do you think of Kev's first pitch uh, from at City Field last weekend? Looked like a strike for my advantage. I, I mean, I thought he was fantastic. I, I got sent a real time video, um, and I thought everything from his outfit to his style, his hair is obviously always top of the line. I would kill <laughs> for his hairline. Um, but the guy, yeah, sorry. Um, but yeah, I mean, the guys, he was, he looked great. He got on the mound, which is a huge win. He didn't baby it. He didn't palm it. He went high and hard through a, through a, I thought everything about it was a win. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm proud, I'm, but I'm not surprised. He's the coolest, calmest guy of all time. You can't fluster him. The moment's never too big. And that was never going to be an issue with Burkhart. And Greg, you, you, you probably know this. I mean, Kevin's like a folk hero kind of city field with Met. Oh yeah. And um, I've written, you know, he's arguably the best sideline reporter ever. So my question for you, Kevin, is my last one. Ever? Like an ever? Or just Like maybe ever. Yeah, maybe oh ever. Oh, my God. What a statement. Wow. That's I mean, a look, statement. it's not really like have I watched every regional sports Holy network of all time. Shit. Uh, but I honestly That's think, a, 
that's hey. the moment. That's the moment of the entire interview, Burkhart. You're the greatest sideline reporter of all time. Clip and that, send it to marketing. It's going to be that. And like Olsen's uh, quote, which you're about to have now, that uh, my game's at WGHT bigger than Super Bowl, but that's for another podcast. <laughs> well, no, my question, though, for you, this is really the question, because we like to get okay. all technical here. Now we're at the end of this interview. So, you know, people uh, who are really into this stuff. What did you try to do as a sideline reporter? Because, you know, like I, I'm giving you a great compliment, but what did you try to do as a sideline reporter on those SNY Mets games? Well, I, first of all, thank you. It's very kind to say there's obviously a lot of great people in the industry that have done this. But I, I, when I first got the job, now I, I, had, I had dabbled in a little bit of television. I had not done TV since college, okay? So it was trying to talk to people, figure out how to do the job, and then, you know, just all of it. Like, you know, I, 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 I'd, I'd, I'd covered baseball, but not on a beat. It was a lot of figuring out to do for me. And, you know, and then just watching a lot of different uh, sideline people and, and, and figuring out, you know, what their routines were and how they were used. And the best advice I ever got was from Greg Picker, who's still the producer there, who's terrific. He's like, look, he's like, this is early on. He's like, I could care less. He's like, I could already see your style and like what you're trying to do. He's like, I could care less how many times during the game you're on. I could care less if one game you're on zero times and the next game you're on 10 times. What I care about is having some substance whether that's a report or reports that you're working on, or whether that's you listening with the guys and interjecting your, um, you know, your personality and what you know, and, and that's what I care about. And that just took the weight off of me to be like, okay, oof, I don't have to cross stuff like I need four hits tonight. Um, you know, as you guys know, sometimes when you're filling out the notes, a part of your column, it, it's some weeks you have a ton of stuff and there's some weeks it's hard to find one, right? So when you're doing the same team every single day, you know, you, you get to those points middle of the year and like, gosh, there is nothing going on here. Right. Like, so it freed me to be creative. It freed me to be creative. And then what I tried to do is, okay, what would interest me? And maybe not like the everyday stuff. Like what would interest me? I would go in the clubhouse. I'd see a guy shaving his bat. So I'd ask him, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? How do you do it? How does it help? Just because I thought it was interesting watching him do it. So I just tried to think a little bit outside the box. And then the other part, was just our team was so good. You know, I'm a little bit of a goofball by nature, right? And um, I think I, I think I try to be personable. So they just kind of let that out, you know, at the point where it was like, I, I was not like, let's go down to, you know, blah, blah, blah. I was part of the broadcast. Gary, Keith, and Ron, and our whole team, Picker, and Bill Webb, the legendary uh, director, you know, God rest his soul, who helped me a lot. Like I was part of the team. Like I wasn't just like an add on. So it was like stuff would happen and they would open my mic. Um, you know, if they would come down to me cause I had play by play chops, they would let me call the plays. I called a couple home runs and I asked Gary Cohen, like, Hey man, I, I don't want to step on your toes. Like, are you cool with that? You know, like, and he's like, just run with it. It's awesome. Like who would say that? How many guys would do that to a sideline guy? So it's really that that empowered me to be able to do the creative stuff that I tried to do. I give everyone more credit than myself. Kevin, I'm going to end with this. I have one final question. Uh, Marshan has what I think is probably the worst Mad Dog imitation I, I, I've, I've ever heard. Hold on. I know. Hold on. Hold on. You guys have listened to the pod. Did you hear John's Francesca's worse? Oh, that was even worse. Absolutely. That was definitely worse. Dog. Right. Dog. No, no. <laughs> Francesca's harder, though. Francesca's a little harder, I think. You think so? No. I don't know. It's, it's hard to nail. It's like it's hard to nail. It really is. I, everyone tries to do them both, but they're really hard. All right, give us give us your mad dog. Come on. All right. So obviously, Mike and Chris. All right, here we go. I'll give you uh, I'm doing updates on a Saturday morning, you know, relatively new. And he's driving in. He's got his show at 10 o'clock. Calls the newsroom. Yeah, uh, you know, the WFN. Uh, Berkey, it's uh, you know, I don't understand. I'm listening to the updates. Where's the Fairfield score? I don't get it. You give me Mammoth, you give me Central Connecticut State. Where's Fairfield? I'm like, Doug, how many, how many, how many schools basketball scores? I got a minute and a half. I just, I ran out of half. Come on, Maggie, you got to do better than that. Come on. That's good. <laughs> That's good. That's classic uh, Russo. All right, these guys are going to be calling the Super Bowl. Seriously, it's been a crazy off season, but uh, what a result for you guys. I mean, what an honor. I think, Kev, you're going to be the 12th play-by-player -player in history. If you look at the names that are in that, that's a pretty uh, – a uh, great company. Uh, I'm not sure how many analysts have done it, but that's also a handful. And now Greg Olson, your name will be added to that. So congratulations. Uh, we'll be watching 
critiquing. Uh, we'll see. Uh, well, you know, we'll see what uh, what you guys do. We watched last year. We we're impressed last year. So uh, I know you guys are going to try to continue on on that uh, thread. But uh, we really appreciate you joining us, and good luck uh, starting this Sunday uh, with the whole NFL season. Yeah, thanks for your time, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. We appreciate the pod. We 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 do listen and enjoy it. So keep it. You know, and I'll I'll, I'll finish with this. Andrew, you always have you always have the line. Everyone wants to be a media critic. Everyone wants to be a broadcaster. <laughs> sure, not us. Have you heard us? We don't want to be broad. We'd rather oh, write. No, no. The, the line is everybody wants well to be a said. broadcaster. They, it also shows how hard it is. They show that every week. <laughs> no, we, we seriously. Thanks for having us. We had a great time. John, what was your impressions? Greg Olson and Kevin Burkhart. That was enjoyable. First of all, yeah, no, we, we haven't made enough of this. Greg Olson, the first repeat guest in the Marsh and Oran sports media podcast history. So, I mean, c- congratulations I to Greg Olson. It's like second guest, sec- two-time guest on Marsh and Oran sports media podcast and doing the Super Bowl. I mean, there's no bigger, like that's a pretty good. I'll give him one A and one B on that. Uh, uh, but um, I can see where he's going to be the, th- the third, uh, the, the first third guest on, 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 on our pod because I just want to take my hat off to him. We came at him, you came at him, with a ton of Brady questions. Uh, and he answered every single one. He was engaged in answering them. He didn't shy away from it. Uh, and I just thought that, uh, you know, I, it's just so refreshing to have somebody come on and answer, a- answer the questions well on any topic that's out there. There, there. there was no dodging. There was no rolling of the eyes. He passionately answered that. And I appreciate that. Well, I think if you want to be an analyst, you got to do that. I think last week when we had Joe Buck and Troy Aikman, they were they were similar. They answered all the questions. Uh, and I think that, uh, quite honestly, if you want to do well in this business, you just have to be honest, especially now with social media and with everyone having an opinion and you kind of have to be out there. I mean, Olsen also has his own podcast company that he started uh, with some celebrities uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that he's trying to make into something big. Uh, and so uh, I think when you... Um, when you look at it, that that is a plus for them. I thought they were they were pretty good last year, so you know I'm going to watch even more intently this year. You know, unfortunately, week one we got giant with the Giants here as the main game, so I'm going to have to look on Red Zone where they'll probably be on a lot there and and get uh, get my fill. Uh, yeah, I'm sure way. we're not going to get them in DC that often. The number one team. Yeah, well, you think you know you get the double double header, but we'll we'll get the uh, Giant broadcast here anyway. But they were really good. I thought their answer, I thought Burkhart's answer on Brady, we kind of can put that to rest. The idea that Brady, if he's eliminated from the playoffs, that he'll be in the booth. I've got, I've already heard that uh, they wouldn't do that. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation of that happening. I think it'd be more likely if Brady were to lose and he was part of their broadcast, they, they'd work him into the studio. Uh, like we talked about, I think it's too, you just kind of, you don't want to have a terrible situation. You're paying a guy $37.5 million to be your analyst. And he comes in, no experience and struggles. Uh, that would be a bad way to start that. So you want to kind of get some reps uh, and really work at it before uh, Brady, if he does, ends up in that booth. Uh, so th- those are my main takeaways. All right, Andrew, let's head to our call of the week. Call of the week. John, this is a fun one. I, I Last week, college football starts, and it, it, I hate when people say you've never seen this before, but I don't know if anybody's <laughs> seen this before. South Carolina State's punter ran way across the line of scrimmage before kicking the ball. I mean, it was amazing. Uh, the call on ESPN, you know, one, I don't know, they have 50,000 channels. I'm not sure which one it was on, but it was one of the ESPN channels. Richard Cross and Leger Duzable. Uh, we're on the call, uh, and uh, they, I think they hit it pretty good. CF's defense for the second time on this opening drive has gotten off the field. Would not anticipate a fake punt on 4th and 19. Oh. But I would be wrong, and there is some room. Dyson punted it late, but from well across the line of scrimmage, Yes. If you're confused watching, so are we. <laughs> That's definitely illegal kicking. And I, it looks like he, he almost could have picked it up. If he he, he just had a kept chance. Running. He had a chance. So, yeah, I think that was just a young player making a mistake. That would have been a great rugby play. I mean, it was a perfect rugby play. But, 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 yeah, but actual American football, not so much. Well, I like how Cross kind of was like, they're not going to punt it. Well, actually, I mean, they're not going to fake it. 
well, actually, maybe they will. And then it's there and they're like, wait, what just happened? <laughs> and every, you're going to have that moment. They did a good job. And this is what the announcer's job is. Because you have that moment for a second. It's like, even though you kind of know that's totally illegal, you're like, wait, can you do that? <laughs> it was like so odd. And then they're like, no, that's kind of weird. What just happened? I mean, you felt bad for the kid. I didn't, you know, uh, I didn't catch, we don't have to say his name. I didn't catch his name, quite honestly. Uh, but uh, the South Carolina State punter, I mean, that's something that will kind of live in infamy for basically ever. Because that yeah, was I've just... watched football. I've watched football for five decades. Even I was like, wait, is that legal? I, like, I, I've never seen that before. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Look, we really enjoyed uh, the show. Uh, we really want to thank uh, Kevin Burkhart and Greg Olson, Andrew Fergersi from Fox Sports, who set that up for us. We uh, appreciate all of them uh, putting that together and, and coming on, and uh, that was an enjoyable interview. Uh, again, if you missed last week's, we had Joe Buck and Troy Aikman. Next week, Al Michaels and Kirk Herbstreet as Amazon's going to debut with their exclusive Thursday Night Football. So we'll have the guys who will call the game. Well, they'll be on the podcast next week. Uh, and as always, we really want to thank AC White and Chris Mason who put this whole thing together uh, and deal with us, uh, especially Orand, who's, you know, you don't even know what goes behind the scenes. He's like, I, you know, with the times and, you know, what works for him and what doesn't. I'm pretty, I'm pretty high maintenance. I am high maintenance. And also a call to action, please. Uh, like and subscribe, rate and comment. Uh, these things, we're told they help. We appreciate everybody that's already done that. Uh, thank you for doing that and thank you for listening.